For much of life, the world of banking might seem both impenetrable and dull, yet there are times when it vaults to being centre stage, at which point it typically ushers in fear, loathing and even panic. Despite leaps in technology and financial disintermediation, banks remain at the epicentre of financial flows. They're the lifeblood of modern economies. With the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank on one side of the Atlantic, a previously niche specialist and generally unknown bank, to Credit Suisse, a global behemoth, echoes of 08 have been heard. And to help get our arms around the state of play and understand whether these are isolated events as opposed to indicative of wider frailties, we wanted to find one of the world's top thinkers on the subject and do a special edition, record it and turn it around quickly. And when we asked some of our network who they'd like to hear, one name kept coming back. It was Hugh Van Steenis, vice chair at Oliver Wyman, previously amongst his other roles in finance, global head of banks and diversified financial research for 40 years at Morgan Stanley, and prior to that, head of diversified financials at JP Morgan. So Hugh, welcome to the Money Ways podcast. Well, look, Simon, wonderful to be with you, although it's a shame it takes a crisis to get on your wonderful show. <laughs> well, you've seen a fair chunk of crises, as have I, but I've been looking forward to this a lot. I've probably got too many questions, which I'll have to pare back as we go along. But the spark that lit the touch paper began in the US. And I guess, let's just start. Are you shocked by the chain of events and by the responses? So I wasn't shocked by the, the smaller of the two banks which went under because they had had for at least six months worries about crypto malpractice and the crypto is, might bring them, bring them down. But no, look, the pace of this is extraordinary. I mean, this is 20 to 30 times faster than anything we saw 15 years ago um, or in the Eurozone you know, banking crisis. And look, at the end, this is, a, a, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but human behavior does. And at the end of the day, this does remind you of some past banking crises where you've had a prolonged period of stability, stability bred complacency, a huge shock in interest rates, and, every, and a couple of people who are reaching for the top shelf of tipple, tipple back over. Um, but no, look, I mean, we, could, we should go into it a little bit more, and I'm sure unpack it. But part of this is really a, a, a function of, obviously, part of this is, is the... The, sharp in, the sharpest increase in interest rates in our lifetime, uh, but also it's uh, uh, um, working through the excesses of the pandemic. So just put some numbers on it. In the States between 2020 and 2022, there were 5.2 trillion deposits bunged into the US banking system, only 2 trillion of which were insured. Now, loan growth, as we will remember, was really tepid. So it's about 700 billion of loan growth. So what do you do with the rest? Well, banks put about 1.9 trillion on deposit with the Fed, but bought two and a trillion quarter of securities. And obviously the foolish ones bought long dated securities. And if you look at, if we come on to Silicon Bank, effectively it was a really dumb rates trade, which went sour. I think it's great to go back to that early 80s period and probably even dial back a bit earlier. But but there's um, there's a great book by Bill Black called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit turgid. It was written by a bank regulator, but some phenomenal um, insights in it. And he said, look, um, in that, what made that debacle worse were the three Ds, uh, deregulation, desupervision, and then the decriminalization of white collar crime. And that's kind of what under underwrote that, so which um, was beneath the SNL crisis. Deregulation, desupervision was on show here. In 2018, uh, the Trump reforms, which were by, supported by partisan, rolled back what was a systemic bank from 50 billion to 250 billion. Now let's put that in context. In, in the Eurozone, a systemic bank is cut off at 30 billion euros. So these very, very, you know, SVB was the 16th largest bank and yet wasn't subject to Basel stress tests, nor to liquidity coverage ratios. And so sadly, you know, with um, not being in the eye of the supervisor, you know, they had some poor practices. It's tricky because I think at one level you say there's not much in common between the, the banks in the States and Credit Suisse. But, let, but if you unpick it, there probably is. So first is in all the cases of the, the, the four banks which have failed, and obviously there's another one, you know, wobbling at the moment, they were the banks of the billionaires and the VCs. And what we've now found is these are hyper-connected people. They're all sitting on social media. They're all frenzied by what's going on social media and whip their money out. And so the pe I think that billionaire movement is something which regulators will have to come back and look at. You know, these uninsured deposits moved very fast. And, you know, throughout history, it's the uninsured depositors which run. You know, even in 84, with the largest bank uh, uh, crisis at that stage, Continental Illinois, it was foreign depositors who ran. 
So let's just stay with the concept of deposit and deposit protection, because there are siren calls that depositors shouldn't lose money under any circumstances. You've written in the FT the other day about um, uh, banks need to be more sensitive to the threat of deposit flight and to pay up for funding, and that that will lead to tightening financial conditions. And I wonder whether you could explain that a bit. Well, there's a couple of legs to this. So look, so I think let's go for, from the end uh, backwards. I think we've just seen the sharpest tightening of financial conditions in history, following the sharp, the fastest bank run in human history and the fastest increase in interest rates in our in our lifetimes. And I think that's partly a function of this, you know, digital bank run in the states now. If you're a mid cap bank, or even a, you're really thinking about how many loans you want to give, what's the right price you want to give them, because you're not quite sure of the stability of your funding base. Now, I think in contrast, some of the bigger banks. Are actually benefiting. They're actually getting excess deposits. You know, hundreds of billions of excess deposits, no doubt. But they're equally going to worry: are these easy come, easy go deposits? So they may not want to make loans either. So I think the financial conditions will sharpen tightly. I think we all disagree disagree about how much. I mean, I think Goldman's just putting in. It's as if、uh, financial conditions just tighten twenty five to fifty bips. My good friend Torsten Slock now at Apollo thinks it's one hundred and fifty bips. I think the bank nerds like me and say Davide Sarah are probably more. In the, it's like a point of increase. But nonetheless, this is a huge hit. In Europe, what we don't know yet is how big a hit it is. I think, though, my conversations with the bank CFOs and treasurers and investors is that they are starting to worry about the cost and availability of funding. And so, I think financial conditions tighten our side of the pond as well. But it, it comes down, Simon, to the point of how sticky are those deposits, and then what you do with it. And you know, you've you're, you've run money for a very long while. If you've got daily liquidity money. You don't put it in ten-year sec- illiquid securities, and I guess in a way that's kind of the mistake. It's a classic ALM mistake, which the C well, there wasn't really a CRO of Silicon Valley Bank as we now discover, but certainly the management of SVB were doing. And extraordinary that BlackRock had been in there and run their slider all over, presumably using their Aladdin system, which we had discussed on previous interviews, and there were all the flaws being sort of you know, highlighted. Maybe it's. Tough, but is it fair to suggest that that tighter regulatory oversight in Europe means that there is fewer accidents to happen in your mind in Europe than the US? I think so, but I think I think there's two lenses on this. So first is every bank above 30 billion in the eurozone has stress tests or of some sort, and they've got liquidity. You know, the liquidity rules are if you know, could you hold your breath for 30 days with no funding? So. Doesn't mean that they couldn't. If the waterline went very high, they wouldn't have some issues. But they've got a much bigger gap. And in a way, what we lost, what happened here is there was a bit of denial by the banks. You know, let's think if we did history again. If SVB had raised capital November last year, very different story. So it gives the banks more time to react. That said, the second though, and I think it's much more again historical sweep is if you think about let's say Japanese banks 15 years after their crisis. They hadn't made that many loans. There was bugger all speculation. There really wasn't much to go wrong on the on the asset side, and so I think what you find here is again, 15 years after the crisis, we haven't had the rampant speculation in the eurozone or the UK that we've seen in the states around the, the tech sector. Maybe there's a couple of fringes around a bit of commercial real estate, but there isn't the same speculation. So I, on the on the on the asset side. I don't think they're the bad debts lurking quite in the same way that we've seen through this big rate shock. Well, we might come back to the valuation situation and opportunity later on, but I just want to stay with、um, this sense of the stronger getting even stronger. You know, is there almost now an oligopoly of the super banks, and from that might flow super profits because you're worried about where you go, therefore your choice is diminished to a very small number. Yes, but I think so. I think we were already creating a super league of banks anyway out of the last financial crisis. And in fact, what's what you know,、um, take the top U.S. banks pre-financial crisis. They used to represent about twenty percent of industry profits. They now represent over sixty percent of industry profits. And so I think that partly is a function of the regulation giving them a moat, and therefore they're viewed to be safe and secure. But I think there's something else which you've discussed on previous pods, which is around the role of technology. The more that technology becomes an important source of competitive advantage for a bank, you know how you serve your clients, the more that kind of winner takes most characteristic you see in tech is starting to come to banks. So the profitability of the top three banks is way higher than even the next three or the three after that. So I think that winner takes most is playing out in banking, and I think that's 
has really helped the the Super League in the States. But if we play that for, we all remember Glass Steagall divided banks from their banking activities, from their investment banking activities. That was all sort of, you know, uh, rescinded. And now we have these super banks that are doing all of those activities. Where's the risk there? And what happens should one see human behavior again? I think this is where it comes down to bank by bank. So look, the history of banking would also suggest you need diversification. And so at least with some of these super banks, they are well diversified between you know, in bu- banking businesses and fee income businesses, US, non-US, and so forth. Obviously, the tragedy for CS was it wasn't diversified enough and it wasn't earning enough. Um, look, I think the quid pro quo will be regulators will be on their case even harder. You know, they'll be fo- focusing even more on the amount of capital and liquidity they have. Look, you could even argue, some would argue that banks are a public-private partnership. I think it's a bit too far myself, but at the end of the day, they will need to be incredibly well supervised. So no, look, there will be a pound of flesh for the big banks, no doubt too. I mean, when, when I I am older than you, when I started, the banks were, you know, uh, if not utilities, they were viewed through a lens of, you know, rather dull with a yield and cyclically sort of exposed, but, you know, you bought them below book value, et cetera. Um, but now it seems that we are, you know, we've moved into a different environment where super profits might be available, concentrations happened, and I don't want to go from the money maze to the moral maze, mm-hmm. but are they... Basically, are we in a situation where the profits are being privatized, but the risks are being socialized? So I, I'm not sure I'd go quite that far. So look, you know, with the reforms of the last 15 years, a huge amount of the risk taking activity has moved out of the banks and into the kind of you know private equity world, hedge fund world, um, specialist players. And if you think about the value creation in the last five years, it's been in people on your on your show. You know, it's it's the, it's the KKRs and Blackstones, it's the stock exchange groups, and so forth. So, I think there's a lot of activities have actually moved out. And again, you know, diversity is strength. The fact we've got a pluralistic system, you can go to get money from a bank or BlackRock or a private equity firm, is is obviously very helpful. Um, but you know, what that means then is that what's left in the banks is a lower margin business, and of course, that means you do need scale. And I think that's the challenge that the more scale you need, that's why the Super League, the top three, top five, disproportionately benefit, not just because of their diversification, because in a lower margin business, you need that scale. So I think it's a, so in a way, the scale is also a function of public policy rather than just because of greedy bankers. Okay, I understand that's right. And we were never called that to you, so that's absolutely fine. But you're right. We've had Bain Capital talk about their, you know, their private credit business. <laughs> We understand this disintermediation impact probably since the great financial crisis, a reluctance from a lot of banks to lend as they would have lended. Now, if the central bankers can ring fence the commercial banking system, they can contain certain amount of risk. But with so much having moved into the shadow banking system, and I said on a couple of asset allocation committees, and private credit is an asset class that exists that never existed, What's the chance that, in fact, the, the, the problem next shows up there and that becomes very difficult for the regulators? So I think for, first, banks are different because they're leveraged. And so, as you see, whatever shock you have, even though post-reforms, the, the amount of equity capital in the banking system has tripled, you know, nonetheless, they are still levered institutions. And so that, that's why you know, the regulatory focus is nearly always on them, because at the end of the day, you're protecting depositors. And that's the foundation of, 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 of bank regulation. So um, as we've seen with the write down of 81s, having some institutional investors lose a bit of money wasn't the policy uh, regulated, but wasn't the policymakers worry. Um, and I think we've seen this time and time again. So I think you and I can sketch out, could there be bouts of illiquidity and what would that mean for private credit or real or commercial real estate? You know, interestingly, 60% of commercial real estate lending in the States was actually coming from the mid-cap banks, not the large banks of of what comes from banks. So I still think there's a a banking channel that we should focus on. But no, look, if if the market is now moving into a phase of forensically looking at balance sheet after balance sheet after balance sheet, there will be a real focus on the real estate and private equity firms to work out, are they well-funded, are they well-marked, and what's what's the knock? And I, some of my smart friends in this space are clearly looking, are there good shorts in that area? Right. And so if you were to look at your crystal ball and think about the next few years, we've got a tightening cycle that's still ongoing. We probably are headed into recession. I would say we are headed into recession in the US. You know, it's just a question of how severe and its duration. 
Would you think that there are going to be a lot more air pockets within the financial sector as a result of that trajectory? I inevitably, I mean, like you, I think I think we are moving to a recession. We can debate how deep, how hard, how long, depending on where you know monetary policy goes. Um, but you know what we've seen in the past is that to these initial sort of problems turn into asset quality problems as people can't roll their debts. I mean, as, as uh, going back to the, you mentioned the SNL crisis early on, one of the phrases there was a rolling loan gathers no debt, bad debts. And obviously, if you can't roll a loan, then that's the issue. So no, like, I think around parts of private equity, parts of commercial real estate, and obviously parts of the economy where low interest rates have just allowed anyone to pay their, to roll their debts. It will be gobsmacking if we don't see some asset quality problems. But going to this point, I think much more of the speculation and uh, around zero interest rates came through in the US than it did in, in Europe or Japan. And therefore, I think a lot more of the focus needs to be in, in the, on those areas. Right, which of course leads to the valuation question and opportunity because it's easy to run away from wanting to own a bank stock. And yet we've got some you know, very uh, apparent value in the European banking space. Um, uh, your former colleague, my former colleague, David Isera, has talked about UBS currently being a, uh, a steal. Um, I see Chris Benodi had taken his uh, 2% stake yesterday. And uh, just before this, I was reading some Bernstein research as well, where they'd taken their targets up. Um, generally, are you, if you were running your own fund right now, would you be pretty excited taking a three plus year view about the value that's there? So look, I think if we go across the stocks, I think there are a good number of opportunities. I mean, you mentioned Davide, he talked about the UBS transaction being a deal of a lifetime. And if you look at the, I think it was a, Autonomous put out a 72% increase in book value for pro forma, a base case from this transaction. Well, I can't think of an M&A banking deal in history, which had a 70% book value accretion. So no, obviously there are some interesting opportunities. I think we do need to pass the kind of the weak from the strong uh, and, and play through the dynamics. And as, as always, banks are ever a, a leverage play on the macro. So if we are heading into a soft recession, then that's a different scenario than a harder recession. But as I said, in Europe, I do think we have probably got a slightly softer one uh, coming through, although you never know. Um, no, I think there are some interesting opportunities here on a three-year view. Um, some of the bank equities are cheap, but also um, have we really discredited 81s? I mean, was this a one-off event? It's very interesting, five sets of regulators have coming out, come out since the weekend saying they are going to respect the hierarchy of, you know, Coco's are junior, uh, senior to, to equity. You know, if that's the case, then the 81 asset class could also be interesting. So look, I think for a smart investor, there's a lot of interesting opportunities to, to work through. Let's switch tack and talk about crypto. I actually don't like talking about crypto much because I'm I'm not in the camp that thinks that uh, I want to have it in asset allocation. But you've made the point uh, that when Signature was rescued, the uh, the FDIC left the digital businesses to run off. Now, just let's talk about that and what's going on and what's the motivation. No, I think it's a really good question. And so, look, um, you know, I'm recognised. I spent 18 months serving Mark Carney, and so I might be stuck in the group think of central bankers all thinking that crypto is awful. And so, I need. I, I realise I've got a prior bias here. However, if you look at Silvergate and Signature's failure, um, it's very tough not to say that the allegations of money laundering and poor KYC weren't a material contributor to the loss of confidence and the outflow of deposits. And as you know, a couple of our mutual hedge fund friends have been short these names because of the crypto allegations. So I think if you're sitting there as the, the Fed as a supervisor or FIDIC as a rescuer of banks, and you see that crypto probably tripped over two banks and also probably lit the Tinder to trip over the third US bank, you would be very negative on banking digital assets. And so we'd already seen before this crisis a series of Wells notices, which normally mean you know enforcement action against firms. And we saw another one last night um, against Coin. Um, but I think it's very interesting that if FIDIC say they don't want the digital asset business to be acquired by another bank, I think you're basically seeing the policymakers trying to put a choker on this. Um, I think one or two folk have talked about this is this, this choke point 2.0. You know, it doesn't mean that this is the end of crypto by any means. But it means that the regulated banking system is going to be under a forensic gaze of regulators. And, the, and it going back to the Super League, the Super League are going to be highly discouraged from banking any crypto. 
So I think it's going to make it more difficult to get your money in and out of the crypto system, at least for some time. Well, yes, as the other side of that, as as a longtime gold bull, without boring on the subject, I'm reminded of Ray Dalio's comment, which is that you know gold's gold's attractiveness is the reciprocal of confidence in you know in the general central banking, and so. I, I would not be surprised to see that become more centre stage as opposed to the 12,000 cryptos or the number that might be out there that are purporting to be digital gold. But it's interesting on that. So one of the major stable coins, and uh, we don't, we're not trying to be pick on any particular name, uh, when you look at where did they leave the money overnight, because of the regulations, the, the largest banks in the States were leverage constrained. They didn't want flighty deposits. So actually, they turned away the stablecoin deposits. Part of, you may argue it's anti-competitive too, but it's mostly because they just didn't need those deposits. They went to the tier two banks. So if you look at who, where the stablecoin de- cash balances were, bizarrely enough, it was Silvergate, Signature, SVB, FR. You know, it's it's. So I think there's also going to be a reappraisal also of stablecoins, which is one of the routes to get money now to the crypto um, house. Now, we've seen in, in the UK, but elsewhere as well, the sort of development of the neo banks, the sort of, you know, we know them. Uh, the, the, the Monzas and the um, Starlings and the rest of them. Where do they sit in the in the reordering of the sort of the you know the banking playing field? Look, I think it's a great question, and I'm not sure I've got high conviction on the answer because I think it depends bank by bank. Because I think what we're also learning here is banking culture really matters. Have you done your ALM and risk management uh, and KYC really matters? And so I think it's unfair to sort of pick on any one institution. Um, I think, you know, at one level, a rising interest rate environment means that you can get more profitability from a bank over time. You just need to get through the speed bump of the, re- the adjustment of the interest rates. Um, I think that uh, you've got a couple of things, though. What you're seeing, and Simon, you've discussed this before, across the whole of the tech and the fintech world is the profit to prof- profitability has to be much sharp- sharper. So everyone is now trying to, you know, their moonshots are now looking to do, you know, shots down the M4. You know, they're much shorter runways that they need to turn profit. So the aspiration for extraordinary growth is no longer there. But nonetheless, if they've got um, insured deposits, they're well managed, they're, they can be good franchises. But I think there's a real, there will be a real reassessment. And you've seen the valuation of a lot of these fintechs for, you know, 70, 80, even sometimes 90%. Yeah. Now you, I think with Mark Carney, were the author, co-author of a report on the future of finance. Um, what would you think might be the two or three important changes over the next few years that will alter the landscape? One would be as money becomes ever more digital, how do we think through what a digital bank run looks like in the future? What does that mean for the way a bank thinks about liquidity and the kind of maturity uh, and, and the kind of loans that it can make on on those deposits. So I think there'll be a re-evaluation of the kind of the digital world. I think second, you have to you know, view that there will be there's going to be a big call to be made around what is the future of tokenization in banking. And I don't just mean crypto, that could also mean stable coins, CBDCs, or even just simply tokenization of of security asset classes. Uh, personally, I think that the whole enthusiasm and the race towards the CBDC is going to slow. I think the, there's going to be a, we need to really stop, reflect, think about what we've just learned. And do we really want to be giving out digital tokens backed by the central bank, which would maybe exacerbate a bank run? So I think that, that but I think it's a deep and difficult question. Um, I, I'd written about before, uh, I, I had to do a, a, a TED talk on this last year, and I talked about that um, s- that central bankers were trying to come up almost with a Goldilocks CBDC. Not too much to destabilize the system, but not too little to be irrelevant and not get their boondoggles. Because to be fair, researching a CBDC has been an extraordinary opportunity because guess where you go? You get to go to Vietnam, the uh, Bahamas, the Car- Eastern Caribbean. I mean, it's been a, uh, a boondoggle for CBDC research, research, researchers. But I think that whole securitization, I think it slows. But I think around the institutional space, you know, look, even when we use our Visa or MasterCard, they tokenize our transaction between you and me because they want to secu- you know, encrypt it. I think we will continue to need to think about enhancing that encryption even if it may not be a you know a digital um, and decentralized one, so that's the second one, and the third one, I think it does come back to the climate stuff. I think that the work that Mark kicked off, and I obviously was in the room with him around 
getting finance to think about climate not only as an in, uh, a financial risk, but also as an opportunity is going to continue to be a major theme. Um, I think it's probably a more micro theme. I mean, just to give an example, Simon, and I hope it's not too micro, you know, um, when the banks looked at climate risk, they never thought that there would, let's say in Europe, be climate shocks in the coming decade. Well, last summer, we given the droughts, I can think of at least four banks I know who are worried about farms going bust this year in Germany or Holland because of the droughts as a result of climate change. So I think there's a, an appreciation, but much more importantly, and I'm sorry it's a long answer, is finance is now thinking about the opportunities of marshalling money. And I think, you know, with the green subsidies, the IRA in the States and the EU plan here, if you tot it all up, something like three trillion of subsidies or discounted loans for a banker and financier, and let alone central banks, that's something one has to get behind. So I'm struck that our conversation is focused on the US and Europe, and it's left out that huge chunk, which is Asia. What are the observations one make about the Asian financial system? You know, big domestic institutions, population growth, etc. Um, are they learning? Are they learning anything from this and trying to do it differently? Or, 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 or you know, should we be thinking about the opportunities set there as investors? Going back into 2008, I always found it fascinating that for the West, a bank run was a surprise. So for the Bank of England, it was the first since 1865. However, there's been, if you take the IMF database since 1972, I think there's been 170-ish systemic banking crises around the world. We, we don't learn from the emerging markets. But in our lifetime, of course, we have had in Korea and Indonesia and beyond major banking panics. As a result, their kind of FX mismatch is way lower. Uh, the liquidity management is better. And so I don't think they're seeing the same stresses that we are at the moment, although I still think this kind of nature of a digital bank run is something we worry about. So I think the nature of the of the excesses and mismatches is always where one should focus. Um, obviously, China is in a different camp. You know, there are some state-run banks there, which obviously have got a series of bad debts, which they're chomping through. But if I think about the private sector banks, whether it be the Singaporeans or the Australians, they look in, in somewhat um, better shape for the moment. But look, you know, like everything in life, one needs to think about the individual bank, not just the system. Yeah. You are vice chair at Oliver Wyman. Um, tell me a little bit about how you, as a firm, and you, because you're called upon to do lots of things, operate with clients. It's a fantastic firm. Its heritage is uh, very much sort of technical and risk for financial services. That's the background. And you may remember at Morgan Stanley, you know, Oliver Wyman and Morgan Stanley used to write a joint report, which Davide and I were on the one side of. Um, and so I think they've got an extraordinary knowledge and technical know-how around financial services. But over the last 20 years, they've obviously grown into many other sectors. And so I think it's, you know, they get very heavily called upon by um, uh, 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 large institutions to help them think through difficult, complex problems to solve um, and try to have the technical know-how to do it. So I think it's a very exciting place. Um, part of my role is to, you know, work with clients, but also I'm doing quite a lot of research as well, bringing on my kind of, you know, investment analyst heritage as well. Right. Going back to the, that climate question, um, uh, we had Nikolai Tangan as a guest, you know, the year before, absolutely fantastic guest. And my gosh, what, a, as you know him well, you know, just inspiring, you know, individual. And you're working with Norge Bank um, on the Climate Advisory Board. Tell us a little bit about what you are, you and he are hoping to achieve. So I think Nikolai and then the Norges Bank itself wants to be a sort of world leader in thinking about investing in the energy transition around the world. And I think there's sort of three blocks to that. The first is obviously understanding investment risks, where, where there is energy transition or climate change. What does that mean for a portfolio, particularly for a, a fund which is you know the largest investor in the world? They own 3% of most European companies and about 1.4 every US company, you know, you know, they're thinking about very long dated risks. So they really want to understand what does the what does 21st century risks mean to companies they are a custodian of? I think the second is to seek out the opportunities. You know, who can be the biggest investor in climate tech? Who can be the biggest investor in uh, the, the the solutions and opportunities around this? And the third, to be honest, uh, I think where, and I think this is where Nikolai and, and Karina are, are very inspirational is, can there be a standard setter? And this is the really tricky one. As a sovereign wealth fund, most SWF sovereign wealth funds, as you know, want to keep a little bit below the radar 
because of their political influence, but because of their they are a, 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 an arm you know a, an arm's length uh, body, they also want to be involved in standard setting bodies to really enhance the disclosure so that people the investment community can make better informed risks. So I think it's a very inspiring uh, mandate, and he's very kindly invited myself and three others to try and join a climate uh, advisory board to think through not just the plan they've got, but how each and every year can they get that little bit shrewder and savvier around the investment risks and opportunities, or how can they actually improve the standards in the market? So I think it's uh, you know all credit to, to Nikolai and team. Well, staying with interesting folks, Sandra Robertson, who is the CIO at Oxford University Endowment Management, you know well. So we did have a little, a, a sneaky little moment to say what would be the question that she'd want to ask you to make sure that you weren't entirely comfortable today. And she said, sort of, if you had a hundred billion to invest in the climate transition, how would you allocate it, and what percentage return would you require? I think this is actually a, 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 both a really important, but actually quite a difficult question. So let's let's can I sort of bucket that uh, you know where are the opportunities? So look first. Um, climate tech, climate solutions um, are incredibly exciting opportunity areas. And they're very broad. I mean, this is from AI to optimize how a grid is run through to data standards, you know, the MSCIs and the other data carriers of the world, through to, you know, quite frankly, carbon capture. This is an area full of opportunity, remains still relatively capital light, so you can get teens like returns. Um, and I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of money trying to chase this, but I think that's the area which one, the climate solutions really has to be the standout and, and, and category one to, to put your money. I think second is what I think of as like the industry leaders. How is McDonald's changing the, the agriculture value chain? How is Microsoft changing the tech value chain? You know, these leaders can have disproportionate influence on the kind of emissions of not only themselves, but the entire industry. Again, Getting behind these leaders and helping empower them to do that is very exciting, probably more in a public market equity uh, portfolio. The tricky bit, there are, there are now here's a tricky bit. Ideally, we don't want to put a ton of money behind renewables. But capital intensive renewables have got a shockingly bad return on investment at the moment. If you want to go and invest around, I don't know, an offshore wind farm at the moment in Europe, you probably can get three to four percent returns on capital. That's not what an endowment, a family office pension fund typically wants to have. It's, it's probably more for, a, for an insurer. It's more the legal and general type returns. And that's the tragedy because that's where the money is needed because we dramatic, we, the, the challenge to national security from the Ukrainian war and beyond is we now need more energy independence. So there are plenty of subsidies going into renewables. And I think we may therefore need to think about, you know, pre-subsidy, that three to 4% just isn't enough. But can you be supercharged or can you get behind the, the, the benefit of those, those subsidies would be a, a question I want to do the investment work on. But I think it's tough to put a lot of your 100 billion into that only to get 3% given inflation is still rampant. Oh, I still ahead of that. And then last, if I'm, I apologize, and I'm sorry, it's a long answer, but it is complex area because it's a whole economy transition is the improvers. You know, if you go back to the kind of the modeling of how emissions fall, half of the emissions falling is companies going from gray to green. It's getting Solvay to reduce its emissions and become a cleaner company. It's going, it's getting Volkswagen to go from dirty to, to green. So I think the improvers have got a little bit of a bad rep because at the moment, that's where the emissions are. And I think what a lot of the NGO community have got wrong is, it's not just about reducing uh, financed emissions, it's about financing emissions reduction. We need to help those improvers get better. And I think that gray to green opportunity is a huge one. And I think that's one of the more exciting ones, particularly both for private market opportunities as well as for public. So I, it's a, look, it's comp as ever an investment question like this. If Sandra doesn't know the answer, it must be bloody complicated. <laughs> well, I didn't, which is why I asked the question. But also, we've had a, a lot of conversation on 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 the show, but also on our second channel, the Curator Channel. We did one with Tech Met Technology Metals, run by Brian Mendel, where of course the irony is that to be able to facilitate all of this, a lot of stuff's going to be pulled out of the ground. You know, yes, even before Ukraine has to be rebuilt, um, that might offer some really quite attractive returns. However, distaste. For well, at one level, it might seem to people who don't want to, uh, you know, pursue that whole. No, it's interesting. So um, I think BlackRock's got 42 ESG ETFs. And obviously, the ESG backlash means a lot of them have started, the, some of the early ones have struggled because they are too broad an index. But the, four, the, the latest one they've just filed is a rare earths um, ETF for exactly that reason, because that's where a lot of the opportunity may lie. 
Well, I'm smiling because we had scheduled um, the head of BlackRock's ETF business to come out on Thursday, but he's just now been pushed back because we have you. So Salim Ramji, who runs the passive business, is, is on and has a great conversation about passive. It contradicts me, or, or shall I say, puts me in my place on a number of things where mm -hmm. I was wrong, but really, really interesting you know, about, about the ETFs, particularly actually in the fixed income space. I'm struck by the fact that you've been, over the years that I've known you, a great thinker and writer and speaker, and you've been called upon to do a lot, particularly right now. How do you make time to think? Oh, it's a, it's a great question. And I think this is something, as a research analyst, I always remember that you need to build in time to think. Well, look, so first is you have to be really hypothesis-led. Um, is one, one thing. Second, I do try and make sure I've got time to, to mug up on the past. So I'm afraid even with the fall of the banks of the last two weekends, I'm afraid I got I, I downloaded again, you know, the best way to rob a bank uh, was to own one. I also downloaded another book. I think history is so important because of the rhyme. Um, and just, I mean, one thing I'm afraid I do do is I, I block out, I have a phony meeting in my diary for an hour and a half a day. Now, probably I shouldn't have said that now because my <laughs> the rest of my colleagues now know. Uh, um, uh, but I put in a phony meeting to try and make sure I've got a block of uh, 90 minutes to two hours where I can actually think or read or research. Um, but you look, it, it's tricky because um, it is relentless. And sometimes, like, I mean, like our good hedge fund friends and investing friends, sometimes some of that thinking time is going for a walk on the weekend as well. Yeah. Just of those strands, you said I'm hypothesis led. Can you just explain or illustrate what that means? The easiest example would be if if this really has become a bank run of the billionaires, wh where are, who else looks like has got billionaire clients? Now that's probably an easy that's that's a very obvious one, but it's looking for those fact it's looking for those fact patterns and repetitions to see who may look similar or who may even look dissimilar. So as a research analyst. Um, I would always encourage my team to actually write the first page of the research before they've done any homework. And so, and then, and then they go off and then try and work out, well, what, was I right? Was I wrong? And actually test that argument. But I think you've got to be, you know, be led by a thesis. More generally, what's on the Hugh Van Steenis list of yet to be accomplished? Look, I remain passionate about markets and the investing world. And so for me, the key thing is to keep joining up the dots between my small amount of know-how and where the opportunities are. And, you know, I've been blessed to have opportunities to serve through, you know, with Mark Carney, but obviously more recently with with the Norwegian Stock and Wild Fund, Oxford and uh, Lord Wyman. I'm just keen to keep joining up the dots between markets and, and ideas and capital. And if we could set up a dinner for you to sit with two of the great finance people, or investors, folks from the present or the past, who would they be? Oh, that's that's a very good question. I haven't thought about that at all. So I am passionate about Keynes and what I've learned from reading him. I know it's hideously obvious, but he got it, nailed it on so many ways. In fact, and I'm going to misquote him now, but he said something like, the sound banker is, is someone who would rather fail, you know, conventionally. And I think that's right. If I look at Silicon Valley Bank, they didn't want to look atypical. They just wanted to fail when, when they failed. They felt commercially. So I think Keynes is just rich and thoughtful and interesting. Through Morgan Stanley, I was blessed to meet some of the most extraordinary um, uh, minds. And so I met Stan Drunk Miller and so forth. Um, I used to go and very kindly go and have lunch with George Soros at his townhouse in London. But if I have to say, I'd love to carry on talking to George because I think his understanding of the macro and translating that to, through into trades and, and micro was extraordinary. And also, to you know, to think about risk appetite. When do you put? When you've got hot hands? When do you really go for it? And when do you not? And so I think um, George remains for me, you know, one of the gods of understanding. You know, effectively as a bank analyst, I'm looking at macro through a micro lens. And I think George, in some ways, is personifies what makes a good bank's investor. Right. And what would you tell a twenty year old Hugh? I definitely would encourage them to read financial history. In fact, my good friend, Neil Ferguson, has a, has a line that he wishes that more eco uh, central bankers had read history rather than uh, doing a PhD in economics. And I'm sure that's right. And so having a really good list of financial history, you know, from, I don't know, what happened in the Weimar Republic, you know, Adam Ferguson's brilliant book, Where Money Dies, through to, you know, what happened, happened more recently. So one is financial history. Second, of course, get the technical skills. But I'm sure that many of them have, you know, to be able to program and code. 
And a third is just, you know, be voracious in listening to the signals, you know, whether it could be just subscribing to The Economist. Um, these days you can get an you know, access, a retail access to Bloomberg quite cheaply. That's phenomenal too. And obviously, of course, listen to your podcast. I mean, I think, you know. <laughs> God, I didn't even prompt you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, Hugh, this has been terrific. And I really appreciate, we all appreciate you coming in a very busy schedule to talk to us and to lay some stuff out on the table that is not obvious to many people, however much they might be professional investors. So thank you very much. We always take away a couple of things, or I try to summarize. My goodness, I wrote down a lot um, today. But um, I like your last comment, perhaps because all those years ago, I studied economic history, but, you know, read financial history. And Neil Ferguson was one of our you know, top guests, as you might might remember, and we're hopefully going to have him back later in the year. Um, and uh, uh, in this whole transition, energy transition, um, the opportunities are not altogether clear, but financing emission reduction and that focus on the companies that are deemed maybe to be the polluters or the non-greens that are in that transition is perhaps where a lot of the investment opportunity lies. And I think that's still being explored. So, Hugh, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much. Oh, Simon, it was a real pleasure. Thank you.